My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and you're listening to Digital Oil & Gas, another episode about the uh, world of digital innovation in oil and gas. And today I'm joined by uh, Mike Scharf. Mike, welcome to the show. Yeah, welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Not at all. It's a great fun. Uh, so uh, t- tell me a little bit about your, uh, your personal background. Where did you, where did you, where did you start out? Like, what's your, what's your story? Um, yeah, so I, um, I studied uh, at Oklahoma State University, studied uh, industrial engineering and management um, with a significant focus um, in operations research, um, and then really went on to, to spend um, a couple decades um, really uh, helping energy companies uh, really across the world implement um, commodity trading risk management solutions. And, oh, right. and throughout that time, yeah, mm-hmm. throughout that time, um, you, you really were able to really get a feel for the, the challenges and, and, and the, the diverse supply chains. I remember this really blew up in North America at uh, 1999, 2000-ish. I recall California as one example going through a massive upheaval with it in its power sector. Is that is that part of your background? That is. That is. I was telling some folks that uh, about that time I was on the Williams trading floors oh. when, uh, when, when there were, were some things that were, were blowing up at that time. Yeah, is that Enron? That was the Enron era for uh, for that some. Was. Yeah, for some of us who are old enough, will remember <laughs> what, what Enron actually is. But it was a milestone uh, signature event that uh, uh, blew up, uh, created the uh, drove the Sarbanes Oxley legislation in the U.S. Uh, uh, caused the separation of the consulting industry from its uh, audit and tax firms, uh, uh, recast uh, the this. In fact, this entire energy trading and risk management area just became a a, a major thing for almost twenty years. And so today, you're in Capspire. What tell us about Capspire? What does Capspire do? So Capspire um, founded uh, about ten years ago. Um, and, and really we do, we really do two things. One is, um, we are the world, uh, believe, believe in our opinion, we are the world's best commodity trading risk management, um, solutions firm. So helping organizations, um, select, implement, and support commodity trading risk management solutions, um, throughout the world. So we've got offices in North America. Um, Europe, and we just opened our first uh, office in Australia. Um, and the second thing we do is um, we're really looking to expand on CTRM and helping um, energy companies um, leverage digital. So we have a number of, of digital offerings um, that we really we help 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 energy organizations. Um, Kind of advance their digital strategies. And is that is that uh, that digital work is is it associated with commodity trading and risk or uh, in in other areas? Um, it is. It is. So, so I would say m- most of it is right. And there's mm-hmm. there's there's really two things that we do. Um, we'll help um, energy companies establish digital roadmaps uh-huh. for how within their organizations how they can um, leverage a, a digital strategy. How can they get value from a digital strategy? Um, most of that work is, is really an extension, extension of, of the work we do within commodity trading risk, risk management. Um, and the second thing we do is we've identified, um, really a number of, a number of gaps, um, that exist in the marketplace. Um, and we've developed products, um, that, that really address, address those gaps. So we're working kind of really hard to kind of push those platforms and agendas forward. Yeah. I know that the, uh, the whole commodity trading area, um, it, it, I, I'm going back a few years now, but it was very much in the news as uh, people were, um, you know, rogue traders were blowing up uh, uh, banks and, and uh, uh, financial institutions left, right and center because of their lack of controls and exposure over uh, trade positions. And um, and so there's I clearly see the, the market there. But why why would digitals be a topic in that trading world? Because 
because it's it would seem to me that the the the, the industry understands the level understands its risk uh, profile related to trading and risk uh, management in in the in the commodity trading area uh, why why is why is digital suddenly a topic there I'm, I'm curious about that so our um you know our strategy and and kind of pushing um a digital agenda mm. is is taking organizations that have complex supply chains, so take an integrated refining organization or a large NGL midstream organization or even a lease crude gathering organization, organizations that have enough flexibility and complexity to their supply chains or value chains um, that it's difficult um, for folks without technology to drive to um, optimal decisions. So we're really, so our, again, our belief, our approach, our philosophy is that we can leverage, we can leverage modeling tools, technologies to model complex supply chains. And by doing that, we can help, um, we can help energy organizations um, kind of drive to what we would call general interest decision making. So how can we help organizations break down department silos, geographic silos mm. um, to drive towards um, the best um, decisions uh, for an organization? But if you, if I, uh, just to be a, a bit of a devil's advocate, so um, I can, I can hear, I can hear my trading, <laughs> my friends and contacts in the trading industry already saying, well, hang on a second, you know, we've been, we've been doing this for years. Um, uh, what's changed? Is it, is it the fact that the volume of data is now outstripping the, uh, you know, the Excel models and, and that people have used in the past, or is it the sheer complexity of the infrastructure just creates more decision optionality now? Or what, what's driving? Or is it all well, of the I, above? I, I, I would say the, the opportunity has always been there. Mm. Um, if, you, if you look at how most large organizations, mid-sized organizations are organized, mm. um, you'll have traders that are focused on a trading book. Um, you'll have marketers that, that are focused on kind of market, market, uh, local metrics, marketing metrics. Um, and then you'll have transportation functions, inventory functions. And what we found, um, is really, really difficult in today's world, um, for those individuals to make consistent decisions in the best interest of the organization. They can make, a trader can make, um, a decision in the best interest of his book. Yeah. Um, a marketer can make uh, the best the decision in the best interest of, you know, his customers, his terminals. Uh, barge scheduler is going to try to <laughs> keep the barges busy. Barges. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But the, the the challenge though is, I suspect, is you can't see the op the opportunity to. Um, optimize at that more macro level, um, given the structure that you're actually in, because all the all the participants in the structure today, traders, barge operators, will tell you they're doing the very best they can, and yeah. uh, so so there must be uh, what's the what what is it that you see or how the market leaders, the ones who get it, like what is it that they see that the others uh, are, are unable to visualize uh, that that motivates them yeah. to want to do yeah. this differently? Yeah, I think um, I think the world kind of most leading energy companies um, have, have seen, have seen um, the margin that they're leaving on the table by not making general interest integrated decisions. Mm. Um, and most of those organizations are either in the process of or have created um, value chain organiz a value chain organization. So this is an organization that sits between, for example, um, you know, refining and marketing that's mm. really responsible for driving and coordinating the best decisions for the organization. So there, there are, again, those organizations that see this benefit of trying to get, um, you know, my crude buyers, traders to make decisions that are consistent with my, you know, RP opportunities or my refined products traders that make decisions that are consistent with, you know, what my marketers, you know, want to sell at a terminal. Yeah, I can, I can absolutely see that. You'd have a, uh, you know, you'd have barge operators, an example, motivated and measured to keep the barge highly utilized and not be as concerned about the margin for a particular mar barge move. 
um, and a trader who's who's motivated to maximize the margin on a trade and take advantage of a market opportunity. And if those two parties don't talk to one another, they can't. The, the barge operator is going to make a suboptimal choice. They'll keep the barge busy, good, but um, miss out on the best margin opportunities because the they, the trader who's driving that can't see what what the barge operator is up to, and similarly, the barge guy can't can't visualize the trades coming at them. Is that, that the way? Am I summarizing that? Is it fair exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, just right. exactly roll right. that out across a complex organization, not just uh, you know a small domestic operation, but imagine the complexity when you get into say five refineries, two continents, pipeline systems, uh, and I think the whole integrated value chain um, that that creates a, a, a tremendously different uh, operating landscape. And so does Capspire kind of like, so tell me a little bit about how the solution then works. I'm now visualizing this as complex organization, a lot of moving parts. Um, it, and so how, what is it that you, like, what does the technology actually do that's different from, say, uh, I don't know, your, your um, uh, basic uh, trading and risk management front, mid and back office um, product? Yeah, so we, um, we've spent the last um, five years, half a decade, yeah. um, building, um, building a solution um, that, and I'll use, I'll use one of your words, building a solution that can, that can create a digital twin. Um, of a, <laughs> no of no a, fair uh, using my your, words against me, man. That's not right. <laughs> yeah, create a, a digital, a digital twin mm. um, of your physical supply chain. Oh, right. So... Yeah. Yeah, so take, for example, let's take a, a North American um, refined products market. So that would, that would, and let's take a refiner that's trying to optimize, let's say, their, their downstream refined products market. We would be modeling all the output of their refineries. We would be modeling um, all of the uh, different, you know, batch or open stock pipeline systems. Mm. We would be modeling all of their storage terminals. Uh, we would be modeling any ethanol routes, truck routes, barge routes. So really being able to mathematically, again, create this digital twin of that network. And once once you're able to do that, um, and again, it's it's not always easy. But once you're able to, again, build a mathematical model or digital twin of your physical supply chain, then um, it, it really, really helps an organization drive drive to better decisions, whether it's a, a strategic decision of increasing bat sizes on the colonial pipeline um, or if it's entry into a new market um, or if it's evaluating um, number of barges you need um, in your barge fleet. Mm -hmm. How many how many time charters should I got? It really, really becomes an amazing tool. Yeah, um, you think to, about the to really evaluate it. Yeah, and, and as we add more, I mean, I think about the complexity of uh, rail movements, uh, complex pipelines, tank farms, barges, and so forth. All, the, all of that modeling is a real challenge, and the tool of choice today is probably Excel. I think, and and yeah. um, and so, but if but so so different tools um, yielding a better and different outcome. Uh, how, I'm visualizing though through through the through Capsfire a lot of data. Are you using or applying uh, a novel digital technologies to process that data? And here I'm thinking about machine learning or, or artificial intelligence or some other kind of sophisticated modern era analytic uh, capability. No, it's a great question. Um, I would say we're leveraging artificial intelligence. Um, but but in, but honestly, it's artificial intelligence in 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 somewhat of an old school fashion using new age technologies. Mm. So we leverage um, cloud data technologies uh, for their ability to process and store large amounts of data. Yeah. Yep. We're never we're leveraging um, native cloud um, computing technology like Kubernetes so that we can we can scale. Um, but then we're using what, what I would say, um, and, and most data scientists would probably say are old school, um, old school approaches. Um, we're using, um, um, mixed integer linear programming. Um, our base model is a network flow model. Um, and then we'll leverage, um, simulation Monte Carlo, um, to be able to kind of apply stochastic, stochastics and variability to it. So mm. we, um, we haven't found um, in the problems that we're solving, um, again, specific to the problems we're solving, 
um, tremendous um, applications for machine learning. Um, but I would say we are using, you know, obviously it is data science, it is artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's very data intense. For, uh, that's certainly you know, the case in, yeah. in, as you get kind of dig into it. And how dynamic that it, is this? I'm thinking today, you know, for, for example, a dynamic model would allow me to take in today's orders or today's uh, uh, production up in, up in a field as the orders come flowing in. And then it allows you to dynamically uh, manage the uh, and make decisions um, versus a static model, which, you know, you, you, you put a bunch of inputs in, it runs and you get a bunch of outputs and then you try and make, make decisions best as you can based on the, the, that sort of fixed data. Are you, are, how, do you, how do you see that playing out at the moment? Is it more dynamic or more fixed or, or is it It mixed? is. Um, the, the model and the technology was built to, to be dynamic. Yeah. Um, and we've got um, had different ranges of clients based on their maturity level. That will use it at, at different, different, different time intervals. Some organizations may use it only for annual planning. Others may use it to do a monthly run, where others will be driving daily decisions, and um, and they'll be integrating, um, you know, rail car tracking systems. So they know, you know, how many rail cars are in transit, where are they located, what's our best view of the ETA, mm. so that we can be making decisions. Um, that are consistent with latest latest information on our supply chain. So, and that really depends on the really the maturity um, and and the need of the organization. So the uh, I think this could be used. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, uh, uh, but I think I could use this if I had this model. I had the data. I could use it t for uh, transaction planning. In other words, I could say. Based on my interpretation of the data, I'm constantly seeing either bottlenecks or shortages crop up here, here, and here. And therefore, I might want to go and either invest in new assets in that location, expand a tank farm, for instance, or um, I might uh, want to purchase someone's existing operation if I can see that they're underutilizing it and I, I can see a better I can see a better path forward. Is that it, it, do you have some companies? You're, yeah, to you're that? spot on. I mean, that's, that's probably one of the most significant use cases is really attacking bottlenecks, yeah. it's a, whether it's a bottleneck on... A pipeline, a storage location, uh, a barge dock. Yeah. Um, right. You, yep. you want to analyze where where am I constrained? Where am I? Um, where am I? Where am I hitting a constraint? And, and how do I? How do I attack that? What's and what's the value? Mm -hmm. If I was to double my storage capacity at this location, or if I was to increase my pipeline capacity, or if I was to, you know, double the number of barges that I had. What well again? What is the cost of that? What's what's the benefit? Yeah, and people have put this technology in place. Uh, Mike, can you share? I mean, can name names obviously, but can you share uh, some insight as to what what effect they get? Like, like what do they see? Do they see a capacity um, throughput improvement? Do they realize better margins? Um, what, what what's the benefit that people tell you? It, this is this is what this has yielded for me. You know, I think it's. Um... I think it's game changing because most organizations, and, and again, it's not it's not easy, right? We're we're talking about totally changing the way the decisions are made, or yeah. or assisting in the way the decisions are made. But those organizations that are are successful, um, it's game changing, um, and they they are amazed by um, by one is how it's making decisions versus how they made decisions before, mm. um, because what we find is most people get caught in in bias, historical bias, or historical rules of thumb, um, and, a, and a dynamic model that maybe I'm just running once a month. It constantly challenges uh, it challenges that historical bias to make people think differently. So it makes people think um, just challenge challenge that there there may be another way of getting product to that market. Yeah. Yeah, they think this is a, there's others there. As one of my clients like to remind me, um, many people in oil and gas um, benefit from having thirty years of experience. But 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 the challenge is if it's the same year repeated thirty times, it's just just one year of experience with a lot of repetition. And uh, if certain rules of life get get embedded deeply in that first year because you were brought up through the organization to treat a tank farm and its behavior in a certain fashion, guess what? You're going to apply the same rule. For the rest of your professional career, unless you've got some data to tell you, nope, you, there's another way to do it. Exactly, it's not it's not Groundhog Day over and over again. Um, <laughs> market, yeah, 
the market is uh, the market is constantly changing. Yeah, constantly changing. One one um, one thing that I, I I read recently was how um, how chess players uh, were learning how to were changing the way that they learn to play chess um, because of some of these um, AI. Um, chess algorithms and, and these AI chess algorithms have played the game or are playing the game very differently. Mm. So that's teaching um, professional chess players to play the game differently. And we, we think of this technology in a similar way. It's, it's not always going to be driving um, the end decision for every organization, but it, but it is going to be teaching um, those organizations different ways of making decisions. Yeah, you can, I can see a possibility to take a digital twin. And I wrote about this in my book about, about this concept. Uh, you take the digital twin and around it, you could actually build a, because it is a virtual version of an operating business, you could turn it into a game platform for your own employees. And you use it as a teaching tool to say, here's our network. Here's the, here's the network of our assets. Here's the, uh, here's the, the uh, how they play out. Let's for a week, let's go away and, and teach you how this business works and how we make decisions. And because you can run the digital version so many cycles faster than you can a real business, because after all, it takes, takes time to move 50,000 barrels in and out of storage. You can do that in a blink of an eye in a digital platform. You could rapidly accelerate decision learning and, and behavior change if you had the, the digital twin. Do, do you have clients who think like this too now? Um, we have some clients that think that way. We have some clients that, um, that, that, uh, I don't know that they think about it as a way of educating, um, employees. Mm. Um, it's a great idea. Well, it's like a flight um, simulator for, uh, for, for a, yeah. a network asset business versus a flight simulator yeah. for an aircraft. Like, why not? Yeah. But yeah. they, they will use it to run, you know, you know, hundreds, hundreds of different scenarios Areas, that yeah. they can imagine for their business. Yeah. 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 Make choices yeah. that way. Yeah. It's really powerful. And uh, so where do you see this going in the, in the long run, Mike? Is it, is it, is it, uh, because one, one level to think about this is, is the, if you have a digital version of, of the plant and, um, the machines start to understand how it behaves and can play out all these scenarios, how much automation could you bring into the, into the system? Or is there still a layer for, you know, humans to do the creative problem solving and what ifs and, and so forth? I, um, yeah, I don't think that I don't think human intervention is going away. Mm. Um, I uh, but I I do believe um, that there is a tremendous opportunity for automation. So and I and I think it really depends on on the problem and the supply chain and the data that's available. So take for example, you know, one problem that we've leveraged the technology to solve, and that's I'm a um, I'm a large uh, um, retail organization that's selling. So I have a whole bunch of convenience stores, let's say 500 convenience stores. And I have a complex supply chain. I've got 200 trucks. Um, and I have a bunch of different ways that I can supply product. I can supply product from my inventory. I can buy the daily rack posting. Mm. Um, I can buy off an index agreement that may have a monthly, weekly, daily commitment. Um, I can buy a prompt gallon. Um, and I've got some variability on demand at the stores and I've got, um, tank limits. Um, so if you think about that type of problem, you know, that type of problem is addressed today by, you know, five supply specialists and, you know, 10 dispatchers, um, and a coordinator. Those are the types of problems where I, I do think we're in, in the next, you know, a couple years, we will get to the point where, where there can be tremendous automation there because, um, it, it doesn't need a lot of human intervention. Yeah. Um, and, and the opportunity is there, but if we, we go back, back, back up the supply chain, I think this, the next called half decade will really be used as technology to, that will be sitting side by side, um, with your schedulers and traders, um, to, to help them drive better decisions. Yeah, I, I definitely can see that world coming, and it's part of the power of the digital twin and where it takes uh, takes us. Mike, this has been uh, fan, uh, fascinating uh, to hear about this uh, these ideas and, and where and how they apply in, in the world of uh, commodity trading and risk management. Thank you so much for uh, uh, joining me today. 
Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and so that uh, brings to a close uh, this episode of uh, Digital Oil and Gas. Um, oh, I, sh- I should ask, uh, Mike, if people want to learn more about uh, you and your your what you're what you're up to, where where do they where do they find you? They may, you must have a website, obviously. Yeah, just go to uh, www.capspire.com. And Capspire is C A P um, S C A. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, C A P. S-P-I-R-E dot com. Caspire dot com. And, uh, and now around the world. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, join me uh, at uh, next time, uh, next podcast uh, publication, which is uh, next Wednesday. Bye for now. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil & Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil & Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.